they dart through the air, slide across the mud, scramble over the jungle floor, swim through the oceans, and can taste really great. There are the invertebrates, all those different animals without backbones with which we share the planet Earth. Hi, I'm Dr. Brian Jerome, and I'm standing in water that's home to this little guy, a leech, which is a kind of a blood-sucking worm. He's just one of the many interesting creatures we'll meet while we take an expedition through the fascinating world of invertebrates. We'll begin our exploration south of here, on the Florida coast. Famous for the great scuba diving they provide, and a great place to fish, these waters are also home to many other kinds of interesting critters. South Florida is a great place for studying invertebrates. It provides a good combination of both warmth and moisture that invertebrates need. I've been out collecting today, and I'd like to show you some of the animals that I've found. Here's a sponge. I also found a very pretty sea cucumber. And here's a beautiful sea star. And I also found a sea urchin and a clam. Now, all these animals look very different from each other. And you may be wondering what it is that makes them all invertebrates. Well, the fact of the matter is, it's what they don't have. None of these animals have backbone. An invertebrate is an animal that doesn't have vertebrae or a backbone. On the other hand, humans have a backbone that you can see right here. And therefore, we're vertebrates. As are such familiar animals as reptiles, fish, and birds. All of these creatures do have backbones. But the fact is, we and the other vertebrates make up only a small, a very small, part of the animal kingdom. Invertebrates, all those many different kinds of animals without backbones, are the real winners when it comes to numbers. The fact is, over 90% of all animals on the planet Earth are invertebrates of one kind or the other. And it's this huge and fascinating group we'll be meeting today. This beautiful beach in the Florida Keys is where we'll begin our vertebrate expedition. It's a great place to look for all kinds of invertebrates that have been washed up by the waves. And here's one that I'd like to show you. This is a sponge which is in the phylum Periphera. It looks quite a bit different than the sponges you're used to, like this one, which is a synthetic sponge that's made out of plastic. But this is a natural sponge. Natural sponges, such as these cleaned and washed ones ready for market, are very much in demand. And diving for them is big business in many of the world's warmer waters. Once divers harvest the sponges from the ocean floor, they're trimmed and cleaned, and then hung up to dry and ready for shipment to market. Here's an old photo of a sponge diver from Florida's west coast. Sponges were big business for many years in Florida's thriving Greek immigrant community. This small dried sponge is typical of most sponges in that it has a simple rounded shape. That means no matter which way we cut this sponge, each half mirrors or looks like the other half. Sponges, such as this little fire sponge, are the most simply organized or primitive of all multicellular animals. They have no muscles, nerves, or other organs or organ systems. This is a typical sponge. Sponges are great natural filters. They have lots of tiny little holes called ostia that let water along with oxygen and food into the sponge. Water, along with waste produced by the sponge, that exits through this large hole called an osculum. This filtering system is so efficient 
that small basket sponges like this one can filter hundreds of gallons of water in a single week. I'm standing in water that's home to members of the next invertebrate phylum that we'll explore. And here's one of its members, a jellyfish. Jellyfish are members of the phylum Cnidaria and are such similar interesting creatures as flower like sea anemones, corals, and sea combs. Most Cnidarians share several features. To start with, they're squishy or soft bodied, being as they are composed mostly of water. More than 90% of a jellyfish's body is, for example, water. Most Nigerians also share the same general body plan. The Nigerian body plan consists of a hollow sac with an opening at one end called the mouth. Nigerians not only use the mouth to let food enter, but to get rid of waste as well. Surrounding the mouth are arm-like structures, often referred to as tentacles. The Nidarian body plan consists of two cell layers. The outer layer is called the ectoderm, and the inner layer is called the endoderm. Between these two cell layers is a layer of jelly. And that's why so many Nidarians like this one are called jellyfish. Notice how the tentacles hang down from his body. I'm going to catch him so we can take a closer look. They're covered with stinging cells that paralyze any small animal that touches them. That's how jellyfish and other cnidarians capture their food. This sea anemone also has stinging cells on its tentacles. However, the fascinating little fish you see here have found a way around the danger. Called clownfish, they're not stung by the anemones. Nobody is sure why this is so why anemones don't kill clownfish. But as you can see, the fish and their host anemones get along just fine. When we hear the word jellyfish, this is what we usually think of. What we're looking at here is the jellyfish's medusa, a mature, free-floating sexual stage. But there's also another side to the Cnidarian life cycle. And this diagram shows it. We'll begin when the sperm and egg join to form a larva. This larva then settles to the bottom to form an asexual stationary polyp. The polyp forms these saucer-shaped discs that are then released into the water. These discs then mature into the sexual form of the jellyfish that we saw earlier. Well, as we've seen so far, the Nidarians are a pretty fascinating group of creatures. I never get bored watching them. But of all their interesting characteristics, it's the amazing rock-building ability that some Nidarians possess, which fascinates me the most. Here, let me show you. This is a piece of brain coral that broke off the reef many years ago. And as you can see, it's rock hard. That's because it contains the same calcium compound that's found in many rocks and the same one that makes our bones hard. Yet, this rock-hard chunk of coral was made by tiny, jelly-soft cnidarians called stony corals. Here we see such rock-building coral. Notice the living coral polyps swaying back and forth in the current. Working together over many years, colonies of these tiny cnidarians can build huge reefs. They do this by secreting calcium carbonate to form an exoskeleton of tiny, rock-hard coral cups in which they live. Over time, the efforts of millions of these tiny little cnidarians can produce reefs that are hundreds of miles long. The next group of animals is going to require some catching. So we're going fishing for worms, not with worms, but four worms. I put some meat into this little cage. Many worms love meat. The cage is to prevent uh, fish from stealing our meat. So I'm going to throw this into the water and come back in a little while to check on it so the worms have a chance to find it. 
Well, we're back here to check on our bait, so why don't I reel it in and take a look and see what we've caught. Looks like we've got some. The worms are pretty small, so I'm going to take this bait and we'll take it back to the lab to take a look at some of the worms. Well, our fishing expedition was a great success, and we landed a fine catch of worms. Now I'm going to take this flex cam, which is a kind of a video camera, and attach it to the microscope so we can take a closer look at our worms. And here's what they look like close up. Worms get their names from their shape. These are flatworms, and they belong to the phylum platyhelminthes. That, as you may have guessed, means flat worm. There are three main worm groups. We've already seen the flatworms. Now we're going to take a look at the round worms and the segmented worms. And here are some tiny round worms, or nematodes. Looking like tiny strands of spaghetti with pointed ends, round worms make up the second major worm group. And finally, here are some fine looking examples of our third major worm group that I just dug up. Notice how their bodies are divided into numerous rings, or segments. That's why they're called the segmented worms, or annelids. They're the last major worm group. Now I know worms aren't much to look at, but as we'll soon see, worms of one kind or another have achieved some of the animal kingdom's most impressive firsts. Take sex, for example. The whole notion of separate males and females, of having different sexes, that we humans take for granted first appears among the roundworms. But that's not all. Every time we take a bite, we owe a debt to worms. That's because the roundworms also developed nature's first efficient digestive system. To see how that's so, we'll use this picture to represent some of the invertebrates that we explored before we met the roundworms. All these organisms have a two-way digestive system. That means they have a single opening both to let food in and get rid of waste. While this works, it's also very inefficient. This bit of hose represents a roundworm. Roundworms are the first animals to develop a one-way digestive system. That means that food enters at one end through the mouth and exits through the other end, the anus, as waste. This one-way digestive system is much more efficient than the two-way digestive system found in less developed invertebrates. And we see it first with the roundworms. Finally, there's the matter of organs. As you know, our bodies, along with most complex animals, are full of advanced organs, such as hearts, livers, and kidneys. Such complex organs can't develop without three distinct cell layers. And that's something that simpler organisms, such as sponges and jellyfish, don't have. All that changes, however, with these little creatures, the flatworms. Flatworms are the first group of animals with bodies that have three cell layers needed to produce complex organs. And while we're talking about organs, here's one of the most important ones any advanced animal can have, a heart. And believe it or not, these animals, segmented worms, are the first animals in which true hearts appear. This earthworm has been specially prepared so we can see its hearts. They're the little red bumps you see, and they pump the worm blood through its circulatory system. They may not look like much, it's hard to overestimate what a giant leap forward having a heart is. Now we're going to take a look at another worm. This is a tapeworm, which is a kind of a flatworm. This particular tapeworm is common in dogs, and that is where this one came from. Tapeworms illustrate another and not so nice side of the worm story. Some worms, such as this tapeworm, are dangerous parasites. Humans can become infected by eating undercooked meat containing tapeworm larvae. 
In those parts of the developing world where it's hard to maintain high levels of sanitation and water pollution is common, tapeworms and other kinds of parasitic worms are often a serious menace to public health. Well, as you can see, we've moved into the woods to find our next invertebrate group, and here's one of them, a rare tree snail. This animal is native to South Florida and is a mollusk another important invertebrate phylum. There are many different kinds of mollusks, but most of them, such as this little conch, are easy to recognize. All are soft-bodied, and most have a shell and a strong muscular foot. Some mollusks, such as certain snails and slugs, live on land. Others, such as this sea hare, a mollusk with an internal shell, spend all their lives in the water. Mollusks have been valued as food for untold centuries. In addition, mollusk shells have been used to make everything from jewelry, such as this beautiful African necklace, to tourist trinkets. Clams on the grill taste great. Cooking them makes the tissue firmer so it's easier to see. I'll use one of these to show you some of the body parts that are common to most mollusks. As you can see, the clam has a soft body that's surrounded by a hard outer shell. This is common to most mollusks. Mollusks have three main body parts. And here's the first one. It's a tough, muscular foot. Clams use this to move around and to dig down into the mud in which they live. Next is the mantle. It's a membrane that covers most of the clam's body. As is the case with most mollusks, it contains glands that secrete the shell. And here, under the mantle, is the clam's visceral mass. It contains the heart, digestive system, and other organs. Together, these three main parts, the foot, the mantle, and the visceral mass, make up the mollusk body plan. Well, now that we know something about how their bodies are put together, let's go out in a mollusk country and look at some of the most important kinds. Shallow bays like this one provide great habitat for many different kinds of mollusks. And even though there are thousands of different species of mollusks, they can be divided into three main groups. And the first group we're going to talk about are these, the bivalves. The bivalves include oysters, clams, mussels, and other two-shelled mollusks. Each of the shells is called a valve. The word bi means two. Therefore, bivalves are two-shelled mollusks. Oysters, mussels, clams, and other bivalves have been important sources of food for centuries. And today, bivalves are still a valued food, and supplying them is an important business in many areas. Remember the pretty little tree snail we saw earlier? It's a gastropod. Gastropods are the second major group of mollusks we'll look at. Notice this critter's single shell. Gastropods, such as snails, and this young conch have either a single shell or, as is the case with this slug, no shell at all. While some gastropods, such as these snails, provide food, others cause serious crop damage that costs millions of dollars to control. The last mollusk group we'll explore include nautilus, octopus, squid, and their relatives. They're the cephalopods, the most highly evolved of all mollusks. Ancient cephalopods, such as this fossil ammonite that thrived millions of years ago, had heavy shells. Today, with the exception of nautilus, cephalopods don't have an external shell. Notice the arms at the front of the squid. All cephalopods have such arms surrounding their mouths. They use them for locomotion and to catch the crabs and fish they eat. 
Valued as food and as bait, cephalopods are also a vital link in nature's food chain, providing food for many commercially important fish. Now we're going to take a short break from the show to ask you a few simple questions. They'll help to refresh your memory about some of the interesting animals that we've seen so far. Just mark the boxes, either true or false, or fill in the blank with the correct word after you hear this tone. Good luck, and let's get started. True or false? Most invertebrates do not have backbone. True or false? Sponges are the most simply organized, many-celled animals. True or false? Anemones, jellyfish, and other cnidarians take in food and get rid of waste through the same body opening. Now answer the next two questions by ending the sentences with the correct words. The three major worm groups are segmented worms, flatworms, and... And here's the last question. Clams, oysters, mussels, and other such two-shelled mollusks are called... a light and chances are I'll end up with bugs, especially here in the tropics. I'm using a lantern so I can collect some specimens. As you can see, I'm being pretty successful. Insects of all kinds are members of the arthropoda, by far the largest of all the different animal phyla. Arthropods also include such very different critters as millipedes, rock covering barnacles, and spiny lobsters. All of them, as different as they look, are arthropods. There are, in fact, more different kinds of arthropods on the planet than any other kind of animal. So far, scientists have discovered more than a million different kinds of arthropods, and they're still counting. With so many different kinds of critters involved, what is it that lets scientists group them all together as arthropods? What, for example, do different looking critters as these horseshoe crabs and this millipede have in common that makes them both arthropods? Well, as we're about to see, the answer involves three things. I'm going to try to catch some shrimp so I can point out these three features to you. It's a great time to catch shrimp. Uh, the tide is high and the moon is full, so let's see how I do. Looks like I got some. Let me get one out here. Arthropods have a hard outer shell that we call an exoskeleton. And if you've ever eaten shrimp, you know you have to peel off the shell uh, before you eat them. The second thing that arthropods have is a segmented body. And here you can see the tail, which is quite large on the shrimp, which is one of the segments. And the third feature that arthropods have is jointed appendages. And if you can look at the legs on this arthropod, you can see that they bend uh, at the joints. And arthropods sometimes have many jointed appendages, like uh, antennas or uh, claws. 
And these are the three features that uh, all arthropods have, and it's what makes them arthropods. Now that we know what it takes to be an arthropod, let's take a closer look into the matter of exoskeletons. Take, for example, these busy little fiddler crabs. Not only do their exoskeletons support their bodies, their durable, tough shells also protect the fiddlers against predators, such as this hungry blue crab out hunting for a meal. In addition, exoskeletons also help arthropods in yet another way. They're largely watertight, and that helps to keep arthropods from drying out in the sun. But as helpful as exoskeletons are to arthropods, they do cause a problem. They're hard, like a suit of armor. And that means when arthropods, such as crabs, grow bigger, their old shells no longer fit. Fortunately, however, nature has found a way around this problem. It's called molting, and crabs provide a great example of it. Most of the time, the crab's exoskeleton, or shell, is hard and rigid. But periodically, the crab's body chemistry changes. And here's the result. This is called a soft-shelled crab. Notice how soft and flexible its exoskeleton is. While it's in this state, the crab replaces its old shell with a new and larger one. The new shell is soft to start, but it soon hardens just like the old one. It's by this ingenious process, molting, that arthropods grow bigger within their exoskeletons. Scientists who study arthropods, such as this butterfly, divide them into a number of different groups. One of the most important of these groups contains such animals as crabs, barnacles, and their relatives pill bugs, and shrimp. All of them are members of the crustacea, one of the most important arthropod groups. While there are many different kinds, it's pretty easy to tell if an animal is a crustacean. I'll show you how the nifty little animal that lives under rocks and streams, like this one. And here's a crawfish. Crayfish look like little lobsters, and where they live gives us a clue that they're crustaceans. Most crustaceans are water lovers. That means that they either live in or near the water. In addition, crustaceans have a hard exoskeleton and two pairs of antenna. Now that we've introduced the crustaceans, let's move on to explore some other interesting arthropod groups. And here's another important arthropod, a spider. Spider part of the class of arthropods called arachnids. There are many thousands of different spiders. All are great hunters. This one is wrapping a bug trapped in its web in an escape-proof envelope of silk thread. The spider will then beat the bug and feed on its body juices. Because they are such skillful hunters, spiders help us humans by eating huge numbers of harmful insects. Though there are many kinds, all spiders have the same basic body plan. First, they all have four pair, or eight legs. Here we see a spider using all her to handle her catch. Secondly, spiders' bodies are made of two parts, a cephalothorax, or combined head and chest, and an abdomen. These characteristics are shared by all spiders and other arachnids such as harvestmen, ticks, scorpions, mites, and so-called horseshoe crabs creatures from an ancient line more closely related to spiders than to true crabs. But of all the many different arthropods, none fill a more important role than the insects. Found almost everywhere, the sheer number and variety of insects is staggering. Scientists have, in fact, counted more different kinds of insects than all other kinds of animals combined. There are so many insects around that it's estimated there are 300 million of them on Earth for every one of us humans. With such a huge number and variety of creatures involved, how can one ever be sure just what is and what is not an insect? Well, as it turns out, it's easy. All you need to do is follow the rule of threes. 
Number three is key here. And I've brought along a model of a dragonfly to show you what I'm talking about. Insect bodies are divided into three parts. A head, a chest or thorax, and an abdomen. They also have three pairs of legs. So the next time you want to know if an animal is an insect or not, just remember the rule of threes. Three body parts and three pairs of legs. If an animal has that, you know that it's an insect. As you can imagine, with the arthropods being such a huge group with so many different kinds of critters, it's no surprise that we humans have a lot of contact with many of them. Sometimes that's good for us, and sometimes it isn't. On the bad side of things, flies, mosquitoes, and other such arthropods spread numerous deadly diseases. And then there's farming. Some arthropods feed on the crops we grow, and that causes many farmers to use some very poisonous pesticides. Not only does this cost a lot, it can also poison the environment. But while it's true that some arthropods do cause us problems, there's also a good side to the arthropod story. Shrimp, lobsters, and crabs, for example, are important foods. And bees, another very useful arthropod, help us by pollinating our flowers and crops, along with producing honey. Still other arthropods help us in many different ways. Ladybug beetles and spiders, for example, help us by eating huge numbers of insect pests, while the horseshoe crabs we saw earlier yield chemicals that are important in the making of many useful drugs. The shore is a great place to explore. Look around long enough and you're certain to discover some kind of fascinating critter. And here's one of them. It's called a sea urchin. Sea urchins are echinoderms, and they're members of the next invertebrate phylum we'll explore. The word echinoderm means prickly skin, and this urchin certainly has that. Later, I found another interesting echinoderm. It's called a sea cucumber. Sea cucumbers may not look like much to us, but in many parts of the world, they're a prized food. But of all the echinoderms, here's the one people are most familiar with, a sea star, or as it's sometimes called, a starfish. This one is a real beauty. Notice its five arms and how they radiate from a central point. That's a common body plan for many echinoderms. And turning the sea star over, we see rows of tube feet running along each arm. We want a better look at these tube feet, so we took the starfish back to our lab where we could use a flex cam. It's a special video camera that lets us get a good close-up view of the tube feet. And here they are, running down the middle of the sea star's arm. By pumping water in and out of their tube feet, sea stars can move along at a slow but steady crawl. While I was snorkeling around here, I found another sea star, which I think is kind of interesting. As you see, it has five arms, but notice how this fifth one is shorter than the rest. That's because it had some kind of accident in which it lost this arm, but you can see it's starting to grow back, and that's called regeneration, which is a characteristic that's common to most echinoderms. Now let's take a few minutes to review some of the things that we've learned as we explored the fascinating world of arthropods and echinoderms. Directions are the same as before. All you need to do is to check either true or false or fill in the blank with a correct word after you hear this tone. Okay, let's get started. True or false? Sea stars and some other echinoderms can regenerate lost arms. True or false? Echinoderms pump air in and out of their tube feet. True or false? There are more different kinds of echinoderms than there are different kinds of arthropods.
Now here's a different kind of question. This time, try to end the sentence with the correct word. All arthropods have a segmented body, jointed appendages, and an... All insects have three pairs of... Well, that ends this quiz, as well as our tour of the invertebrates, all those fascinating animals without backbone.